Time to welcome a guest. Who is it, Poppy? Matt Barnes. He's an agitator. He's an instigator. He's with the Lakers. Now, let's agitate and instigate him. Let him know how it feels. Let's learn some more about Matt. What's the worst pain basketball has ever made you feel? Um, probably just the, the rejection and not getting a chance to play early on and really knowing that I can play but not having an opportunity. Um, I, I take Jeremy Lin, for example. You know, he's really taken the world, not only the league, but the world by storm. And this was the guy that sat on, sat on the bench at Golden State and didn't really get a chance to play, was cut by the Rockets and didn't get a chance to play, and really found a home in New York. And I think there's several guys in his position, in my position, that just need the confidence of a coach um, to just be able to go out there and play your game. And, uh, you know, Jeremy Lin's had a little bit of turnover issues early on, but Dan Tony stuck with him. And, and you see he's led the New York Knicks on a five-game winning streak. You know, we were, all, <laughs> we were all watching the game last night in the training room as he, you know, he waved Amari Stoudemire away and took the game when he shot in Toronto and hit it. Um, you know, when you have your coach and your team behind you, everybody in the NBA can play, and I think that's all it takes. Our test came running through the locker room yelling Linsanity. What's the matter yeah. with him? And Ron is crazy, but, uh, you know, Bynum was saying he was buying a jersey today, and I'm really happy for him. You know, I got a chance to know Jeremy. I had a Golden State, a former Golden State versus current Golden State Warrior last summer game in the Bay Area, and uh, he came out and played and showed a lot of support, and he's really just a good kid. I definitely didn't like the 38 points he gave us the other night. I wanted to guard him the whole game. I know Ron wanted to guard him the whole game, but, uh, you know, he did it and he's playing with a tremendous confidence and a swagger that you can't touch right now. And, and when someone's in that kind of zone, you're going to see you know, numbers like he's putting up. How would you describe your childhood to a stranger? Um, that's, that's funny. It, it was rough. Um, you know, growing up, you know, sharing rooms, food stamps, drugs, um, you know, violence, you know, seeing guns at an early age, seeing people get stabbed at an early age. But then uh, making a move from San Jose to Sacramento, and uh, my, my parents tried to do their best to put me in, in the best schools possible and kind of just learn the other side. You know, I'm Italian and black, so I was really growing up was in the black and the Mexican neighborhoods. And then <clears throat> once we moved to Sacramento, my, care, my, my parents put me in the predominantly white school, so it was just really a culture shock, and it was hard for me to kind of get the, the crossover at er, um, early on in my, in my life because I wasn't black enough and I, I wasn't white. So I really didn't have anywhere to fit, but I kind of found as I grew up, the common ground was I was the best in every sport, you know, football, baseball, and basketball. And I slowly think that's kind of how I was accepted and how people first started to like me was, you know, that I knew that I was the best. They knew that I was the best at all the sports. And it didn't hurt that I was a lot bigger than them. So, if, you know, they kept talking trash. I was going to take care of them. Didn't you used to hate Kobe? No, nah, Kobe and I never hated each other. You know, I've known Kobe since I was in college um, when he used to come up to UCLA and work out after our practices. And we've just always com uh, been competitors. You know, it, it's never been a dislike for each other. Um, I think in Orlando probably was the most chippy it's been between he and I. But, um, you know, we talked after that. And, uh, you know, as soon as I found out, I, he found out I was a free agent. You know, I gave him a call. And, um, you know, he asked me if I wanted to be a Laker. And, and three days later, I was a Laker. You faked throwing a ball at his face, though. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, just sometimes in the heat of battle, you know, you don't really, stuff happens. You know, I wasn't really, if, if you look back at that play when I kind of laugh and I look at it, I really wasn't looking at him at all. I didn't realize how close I was to really hitting him. You know, I was really looking at the play develop on the back side and to see that I was really like an inch or two away from his face and he didn't flinch. You know, that's, I want to play with somebody like that. What do you point to and think that was the coolest part of the story? Uh, the Golden State Warrior team. That Golden State team in 2006, 2007, I was crazy. I went out there to work out with Baron Davis. I hadn't even had a team yet. I was coming off of two years in Philly where I didn't get a chance to play at all. And I got into it mo with Mo Cheeks. He just used to dog me constantly, constantly. Like he thought it was funny, but you know, it really stuck with me. Why did Mo Cheeks ride you so hard? He just thought it was funny. You know, he was just, he, I, I think, uh, he was one of those guys that was still caught up between being a player and a coach. He liked to joke too much. He thought everything was a joke. And, uh, you know, I remember he used to stay after practice and work out and shoot shots. When no one was there, I'd just be by myself sometimes with the net, catching the ball. And he'd tell me, you know, why, why are you shooting that shot? You're not going to get to shoot it here. And I looked at him like, boy, yeah. oh boy, if I didn't care about this career, <laughs> I'd be at you. But, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that I learned and I took. And I remember the first game we played, Philly, when I was in Golden State. I think I gave him 34 points. I hit seven or eight threes. I think I was 10 for 12 from the field. 
in every single shot I hit, I looked at him and had something to say, just like, you know, thank you, really. But I wasn't saying thank you. I, you, you could probably imagine what I was saying. I, I really owe a lot to him, too, because he was the one that kept that fire alive. You know, even though it was a make or break season, I just knew that I wanted to prove to him and stick it to him for the way he treated and disrespected me, not only as a player, but as a man. You know, the kind of stuff he was saying to me really stuck with me to this day. Matt, my father has a question for you. Go ahead, Poppy. Tell me about your kids. About my kids? Yeah. I got uh, two identical twin boys, Isaiah and Carter, who just turned three in November. And um, they've been, been my world. You know, they've been everything to me. Um, basketball fans, daddy fans, uh, you know, I can't do any, anything wrong in their eyes. Uh, the one thing I'll say is uh, Carter is the biggest Kobe Bryant fan in the world. He, uh, he, he, said, he tells me, Daddy, I love you, but I'm Kobe Bryant. <laughs> so anytime we're playing basketball, he's Kobe. <laughs> They're just two little me's. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, I sit and look, and I, I can't understand to each his own, but I can't understand how anyone ever just leave a, ch a child behind. You know, um, there were at that times I didn't think my relationship wouldn't have worked with, with my girl. But at no point did I ever think about abandoning my kids. And, I, and for those, the dads and the, even the mothers out there sometimes, I just don't understand how you can just leave a kid behind. Because they, you know, they never choose to come in this world. You know, you bring them in this world, so you got to take care of them. And, uh, you know, that's something I'll always do for the rest of my life. Matt, thank you for the honesty. That was great. No Gracias. <laughs>